He is a co-host of Fox and Friends. He is my friend. He is a fellow Texan. And he is with me today on Off the Rails. He is replacing Pete Hegseth. <laughs> One could say it's a step up. A step up from Hegseth to Lawrence Jones. What's up, LJ? You got two, you got two Texans on, on, on the chat today, so it's great, man. It's my first time. Congratulations, bro. Thank you, man. It's uh, It's gone very well, and I only expect it to do um, better with you here today on the Off the Rails segment of the Will Kane Show. Hey, let's get into it. We're going to hit some highs. We're going to hit some lows. We're going to have some yep. fun. We're going to be serious. Let's start with what I think is a fascinating story. You've probably talked about it this morning on Fox and Friends. We now know something, Lawrence, about the seven already impaneled jurors in the case against Donald mm-hmm. Trump in New York. And Lawrence, it's fascinating. We have profiles of these seven jurors. Now, later this week, they're mm-hmm. going to impanel 100 more potential jurors and try to find the remaining five and the alternates. But we have half the jury right now. And as I look through, Lawrence, you've got, you've got single mothers, you've got teachers, you've got CNN watchers, you've got New York Times readers. Um, as I look through, I've identified one juror. Lawrence, that represents hope for Donald Trump. Yeah, uh, you got some attorneys as well. Um, I I think it's going to be really hard for the president here. I'm also kind of astonished that they've gone through the jury selection this fast. You know, interesting fact, um, before I I joined the channel uh, and before I even got into the whole political space, I was a private investigator in Texas. It's kind of like what I did on the off time. when I was getting my criminal justice degree. And part of the things I used to do for criminal defenses is research the jury pool. And, you know, of course, you know, in the court system, you get so many strikes that you can challenge. Then you got the judge that can do any of them for, you know, if any, if someone is disqualified, but you got the, the defense that is trying to get rid of as many as is possibly can. I think it's between 10 to 15 in New York. Um, just by the voting data in New York, in Manhattan, it's going to be hard for him to get a fair jur- jury pool. Um, but again, Will, all he needs is one. All he needs is one solid juror that's going to look at the facts, that's going to look at the evidence, that's not going to be blinded by their political allegiance uh, to get a fair trial. I know that's hard, but yeah. again, he has some of the best attorneys. Let's Let's see what happens, man. So when you were in private investigator looking into potential jurors, I'm curious, what'd you do, LJ? Like, we're already reading that one of the obvious things they've done, and the, Jonathan Turley was here on the Will Cain Show on Monday saying they would do this, is dive into the social media of all of these jurors. And I think one was dismissed because I think he had tweeted or put on one of his social media platforms, lock him up in reference to Donald Trump. I mean, that's obviously going to get you struck from a potential jury. But what would you do? I mean, now it's... I'm, sure very focused on social media what would you do back then to kind of dig into a potential juror yeah so unfortunately will my my side of the beast was after the jury had already selected so what what you'll have a lot of time is people that have will hire a consultant as they're picking the jury so once the jury was already selected then i would do a deep dive into all the jurors to kind of figure out in a in a sense what makes them tick so you know, mm-hmm. I wish that, um, you know, when you're dealing with a jury, everything was about the law and the facts of the case. But humans just don't work that way. So you want as much as information as you can about that person so you can tailor your message as you're presenting the case before them. Oh, man, you're spot on. So one of my very good friends who's who's now been a guest here on the Will Cain Show is a, an attorney named D- Dave Sugden, and he, he um, specializes in trials, Lawrence. He tries cases eight to ten times a year, which is a rarity for an attorney. Um, right. So he has a lot of experience in, in, in understanding uh, juries and picking juries. And he said to me when I sent them these, these seven juror profiles, he said, man, Trump's in trouble. Um, if I am his attorney's, I am looking for the one person who is not afraid to be disagreeable, who's willing Mm -hmm. and strong-willed enough 
to go against the grain. They need a unanimous verdict. So finding that, as you mentioned, one potential maverick is more important than even looking into what their predisposition is. So he's saying they need to find someone, and this is so hard to find, somebody with courage who can sit in a room, Lawrence, with 11 others going, either you're wrong or 11 others going, we need to get out of here. I got to get back to work or my kid needs to get back to his travel baseball team. Somebody strong enough to go, nope, I don't agree with the rest of you 11. Will, what you're describing is someone that is unmovable. <laughs> like you, you need someone that has strong convictions, either way, honestly, that will say, ah, I just can't go along with this. Um, you know, one of the things that we also would do is get into the background of their life and a personal story, something that wouldn't disqualify them from being a juror, but that emotional connection as you're telling the story. You know, one of the one things, and I look, I haven't reviewed the case in a way that his attorneys uh, have, but just from an emotional standpoint, there is something that the president continues to do publicly that says, I've been wrong, that something is not fair, that the, I, that I was targeted. If they can find someone within that jury selection that either was targeted before in some form of way, say you had someone that was wrongfully charged uh, in the criminal justice system, or know someone, their mom, their dad, their aunt, if you can strike at that, that's something that can be beneficial. Right. So I've got my nomination, Lawrence, as I mentioned, for who that one juror may be. But I want to share with you in the audience the profile of the other six so far. Yeah. So I'll try to do this fairly quickly but uh, and jump in if you, if you have a comment, Lawrence. But so the, the four-person, juror number one. So this is already somebody with power. By being nominated mm -hmm. the four-person, the rest of the jurors will be naturally deferential somewhat to the four-person. Correct. Um, he's in sales. He— he was born in Ireland. He is married. He doesn't have children. He gets his news from the New York Times, the Daily Mail, and it says sometimes Fox News, sometimes MSNBC. Um, and by the way, just on the four person for a moment, you and I were talking about finding that person with courage to be disagreeable. It goes against human nature. And that's what I've talked to my friend Dave Sugden about. Forget politics, right? Forget yeah. if you're left or right. People sit in rooms and they don't like being disagreeable. It's fundamental to human nature. You want to fit in, and that's going to be really hard. And who knows where the four-person leans? But my friend told me, Lawrence, the first juror to stake a strong claim can make it game, set, match within the first five minutes of deliberation. Everyone else will inherently be agreeable. That's exactly right. And the one thing that Donald Trump has working against him is that he's a rich white man um, in New York City. Mm -hmm. And so there is not going to be a lot of sympathy for him in your any type of friend group, let alone in, in a New York City jury pool. So, you know, he's going to have to watch his antics uh, in court as well. Because remember, these are human beings. I, I keep stressing, and it's sad because America, for all its faults, has the best criminal justice system. But it's not perfect. Um, there, there's a reason why OJ got off is because you had folks that wanted to send a message to the criminal justice system. Hey, we've been wrong before and we want to stick it to the man. Right. It shouldn't operate like that. Right. But that's the reality. If you talk with people in black America, no one believes that OJ was innocent. They just wanted to stick it to the man. People celebrated outside of the courtroom, not because, um, they had sympathy for OJ, but he was the, a tool that they could use to go at, at the system. It sucks. It's sad. This is not right. something that we want to talk about, but it's the reality. Do you think that you're qualified to speak for Black America, Lawrence? Like, if I if I did a survey here of Fox <laughs> personalities, <laughs> what was it you and I got into the other day? Did you say that I accused well, you of not 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 being Black enough? <laughs> I said you attempted to, you attempted to. And look, I think it's fair because there are some people that appear on the network or appear on in conservative media that are black, but don't really uh, affiliate themselves with the community on a day-to-day -day basis. So oh, 
just because you have the color of the skin, which is, I think, the point I was driving at, doesn't mean that you know cultural things. Let me tell the audience what I'm talking about. So Lawrence and I were in the green room, and I looked across the green room, and there was this, like, what was it, like an e-scooter or like an e-skateboard or something like that? Yeah. Somebody had clearly was, ridden yeah, into the was, office. Right. And I said to you, is that yours? And you said, what do you mean is that mine? And I said, well, you know, that might that might be something you do. I could see you kind of hopping on an e-skateboard and riding over to 1211 Avenue of the Americas. And you kind of looked at me and you go, why don't you just challenge you my look. blackness? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I go, I go does, does it look like I would get on that scooter? I mean, does that look like something that I, that I would do? And, I, and you go, well, I like to judge people by the individual. And I go, Will, I get that. I, okay, I'm, I'm for the individual as well. <laughs> but does it look like... I'm the, now if I can if I was a Steve Urkel black conservative, then I'd say, okay, all right, I'm on the I'm on the scooter. But that's not me. So I, I was <laughs> I was I was I was like, where are you going with this? I was personally what it had nothing to do with the scooter. I'm like, does Will think I'm that guy? Does that because then we're gonna have to have a conversation. Well, well then I said to you, well, there is a black skater subculture there is like the black skater guy and you're not the black skater guy but there is definitely a black skater yes, guy yes, subculture. yeah little wayne is one of them yeah right yeah yeah so, he's one of the rappers that so, like stuff, so if I'm i like, said so if i said will, to little wayne me. did you ride the e-scooter in would he say you're challenging my blackness would little wayne nah, would be, be like, similarly insulted yeah. if i said hey <laughs> No, he'll say I own the company. That's what he would say. I probably own stocks in the shares. <laughs> yeah, you damn straight. He was probably like, I'm the face of it. I'm the face of uh, it. Yeah. All right. So Lawrence Jones, uh, perfectly qualified to speak for Black America. Let's. So basically, <laughs> all of these jurors, Lawrence, said that they listen to CNN and they read the New York Times. I honestly think if you've been listening to CNN for the past uh, five, six, seven, eight years you probably have had your brain poisoned. You're probably perfectly incapable of being impartial when it comes to Donald Trump. And I do think there's an argument to be made that very few people, regardless of which side of the political spectrum you're on, are capable of impartiality when it comes to Donald Trump. But a little more color on some of these, um, some of these jurors. Uh, as you mentioned, there's a corporate lawyer originally from Oregon, uh, not married, doesn't have children. There's an English teacher in a public charter school system. My kids went to charter schools. Um, she's got her master's degree in education. She's a young black woman who isn't married and doesn't have children. She says she avoids uh, political conversations. I would say, you know, a lot of that suggests she probably leans to the left. Uh, again, allowing, as you point out, for individuality. If you're playing by the numbers, if you're playing by the, the odds, not going to be friendly to Donald Trump. A juror seven is a civil litigator. She's married with two kids and lives on the Upper East Side. Um, said there were likely Trump administration policy she disagreed with. Another red flag. Um, six is a software engineer at a large broadcast company. Really young, apparently. Recently graduated college. Currently living with three roommates. She also gets her news from TikTok. This is not good for Donald Trump. But I submit to you, Lawrence, juror number four. Juror number four is the one hope for someone, I would think, who might show impartiality and courage, perhaps, in being that one juror that is needed by Donald Trump. Here's juror four. Runs an IT business for training and consulting. Attended one year of college. An older man, originally from Puerto Rico, who is married with adult children and two grandkids, told the court he finds Trump fascinating and mysterious but didn't indicate any strong feelings about his politics right now with five more yet to be impaneled i would say donald trump's hope is juror four yeah um but it also appears like some he, he's fascinated by him but is he easily persuaded I, I, let me tell you will the, the thing that i don't like and i don't understand how uh the legal counsel allowed this to happen that there's two lawyers uh, on the jury, uh, on the jury list. I mean, they're going to dominate that room A. And I mean, the law school, which I didn't go to, 
Um, and you can correct me wrong because all my friends end up, I decided to do TV and I, I skipped out on law school. But this is what my all my friends that are now practicing lawyers tell me. They were all in CJ students with me. Law school teaches you how to think and think and think and think. And it's, it's not so much as convincing someone of your argument. I worry about those two lawyers dominating the room. And that that yes. becomes problematic for Donald Trump. So why the legal counsel allowed that to happen, I don't know. There is some hope in that juror, but the, just find him, finding him fascinating is not enough for me. Um, you know, I have a fam, family full right. of Democrats, and they find Donald Trump fascinating. Um, that doesn't mean they're going to they're gonna vote for him, although some have changed their mind and will vote for him this go way, way around, you know. I think, I think, I don't know, the profile, older man, Puerto Rico, one year of college. I just think he probably is someone who is um, going to be more open based upon life experience as opposed to indoctrination in a college or, for that matter, in a law school. But even though that may grant him impartiality, to your point, it doesn't grant him the strength to stand up against a room that That's is already right. headed in one direction. And I think you make a great point about the lawyers. The lawyers will probably try to dominate the room. I'll give you mixed on the lawyers as somebody who did go to law school. Going to law school actually is one of the formative moments in my life when I became more or less conservative uh, because I began to understand the inner workings of not just the law but logic, how your opinions lean on one another, depend upon one another in the same way the law is supposed to fit within itself philosophically and build upon itself. I understood the Constitution coming out of law school. And I think there's a chance those lawyers would look at this not according to how they feel about Donald Trump, but more about how they understand the law. But I only say it as a chance, because going to law school and understanding the law doesn't inoculate you from the same thing that suffers or plagues the rest of humanity, which is just your feelings about the character of Donald Trump. That's right. That's right. And, and that's my concern. Um, Will, if... if if it was simply about being objective, um, I would say those two lawyers would be the, benef the best benefit to the president because you have a prosecution that has stretched legal theory to make a case, a case that's been passed on by the Southern District of New York, the Elections Commission. So if it was just based on logic right. and legal ease, I say two lawyers on there, this case is over. But of course... The courtroom is not going to work that way. So if they can be honest brokers, and I think that's going to be the big question. And I also think it would be really telling, too, about if you have two lawyers that look at a case. By the way, you got to imagine the defense, the people representing Donald Trump, are going to just say it's just exactly what I just said. The Southern District of New York, the most aggressive prosecutors in the United States, if they come after you, you're done. You're done, period. And they said, we're going to take a pass on this. The Elections Commission, right. pretty aggressive, saying, you know what? We're going to take a pass on that. So if it's just based on the law and being able to be an honest broker based on the law, two lawyers on there, that's the win for the president. I just don't think it's going to be that way, Will. Are you wearing men's shoes today or are you wearing women's shoes as we speak here on the Will Cain show? I am so I'm so glad that you brought this up. First of all, I'm I'm in my house. Uh so I'm not wearing any shoes at all. But I was I'm 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 an avid watcher at Fox. Wait, wait, the weekend. wait, 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 wait. Okay. I'm just gonna yeah, throw you know where I'm going with this, right? into your passion. Uh, no, not yet, but I'm curious. You're at home. You barefooted yeah. or are you a house slippers guy around the house? No, no, barefoot. I'm barefoot. I'm a barefoot yeah, guy too. I'm, I'm barefoot because you know why? Have, I get I get hot. Has to have house I get shoes. hot. I do have house shoes. I yes. think it's appropriate in the winter, but uh, it's it's hot right now, so I I, I need to I, I need the freedom of the the wind. But I'm so glad you brought yeah. this up because I was going to save this for TV, but I'm going to break it on here. So I saw you on the okay. weekend, and you were talking about jeans and you knowing women's jeans. Don't you ever come for me again? about wearing my fancy shoes. When you know the different brands and styles of women's jeans, how could you ever come from my man card 
after openly, I mean, just openly telling the well, world that this is the I have thing a response. that you do. Okay, let's hear it. I have a response. All right, yeah. so first of all, here's the background for the audience. I was sitting there on Fox and Friends with Lawrence, and I looked down, and I saw uh, red bottoms to his shoes. Chris you know, and Louboutin. Chris and Louboutin. Side, and I said, oh, yeah, I, I know, I know. Yeah, which I'm familiar with. That's a fancy, uh, in my understanding and personal experience, woman's brand. And I said to you, oh, <laughs> you got those red sole shoes on. I didn't know they made men's shoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, because I, I could fit my 13 size foot in a woman's shoe, because that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, it turns out they make men's shoes, so... Lawrence, yeah. I, I'm Very not good sure it does makes it any better for you that you're wearing men's Christian Louboutins. I think I said it right, oh. right? Louboutin. Yeah. Um, my second point, Lawrence, is just because I understand women's jeans doesn't mean I wear women's jeans. All right? So be careful now on the analogies. You're over there putting I on mean, Christian Louboutins. I'm not putting on mother jeans. I just have an appreciation I'm, for mm-hmm. when a woman has on a nice pair of jeans and noticing and then saying, I'm going to get that brand for my wife. I do the same thing with perfume. Okay. And by the way, I've right. really debated this, Lawrence. I've done it more than once at Fox. I've said, excuse me, I don't want this to be weird, but that's a really Why do nice you say that? Why, why do brand? you have to say, Will, why do you have to say, I don't you want know this why. to be weird? Why do you, you have to say that? You, I don't well, mean I to mean, be weird. You know why. Yeah, you know you why. You know why? Because it's just not normal, Will. So you have to let people know, listen, <laughs> I know this is out of the mainstream. People, Guys are not supposed to do this. I know, I know it comes off weird. But I like your jeans. No. Can you tell me the brand of this I think jean? What style is it? No, is I've never fit? said that about jeans. <laughs> I just know I, I'm perfectly capable of discerning the brand of a jean on my own. But on the on the on the perfume, I'm not worried about culture. I'm right to ask, hey, what's that perfume you have on and then want to buy it for my wife? But I'm not afraid of culture. I'm afraid of the HR department. So I have to lay some runway down no. of, you know, hey, I hope this isn't weird, but <laughs> about the uh, smell all right lawrence i want to ask you this yeah I, I had this conversation fascinating conversation lawrence i'd love for you to go back and listen to it but it's last week on the will kane show with adam coleman he's written a new book okay. called from black victims to black victors and it, it, it's it's an interview that did really well here on the will kane show you know over one hundred twenty thousand views on facebook and um and i would encourage anyone to go check out that conversation but i had this part of this conversation with him lawrence and i thought i'd really love to hear lawrence's perspective you know, yeah. I, I have this, you, you know, my sons grew up, they went to school uh, f- before we moved back to Dallas to a school in Harlem. They were involved in soccer. They were an extreme minority. You know, most of the kids were black and most of the kids were not just black, but they were the children of African immigrants. Right. And one of those who I'm very close with, the fathers and the sons, has gone on to, to great things. OK, he, he's in the New York Red Bulls Academy. Well, the Red Bulls were in a ta- uh, one of the biggest tournaments of the year, Lawrence. And on two occasions, their players were racially abused. That's the story and confirmed by a referee, right? And the Red Bulls pulled out of the tournament after the second occasion, said, we're, we're, we're going to walk from the tournament. And this is a big thing in the world of soccer, Lawrence, like they're trying to crack down on racial abuse from the crowd and on the field. And I'm curious, and I'm, I'm not going into this with an agenda or my mind made up. I'm cur- curious what you think. I'm not sure you solve a problem like racism by protesting with by the withdrawal from racism. You know what I mean? Like, like I imagine you played sports, I played sports. You need yeah. to be prepared to hear anything on the athletic field because whether or not they're racist, I don't know, is almost beside the point. They're trying to get under your skin, right? And oh, I was that player. I just don't know if you give power. Yeah, and I'm saying I'm not sure if you're not giving power to the racist by – responding in that way to the racism? You know, Will, something that I'm not proud of is uh, when I when I played basketball, uh, I was really uh, not physically dirty, but mentally dirty on the court. And anybody that knows me that played in, in, in Texas would say, okay, he's on TV. You should see hear some of the stuff he was saying. I would talk about their mom, their grandma. I would do anything to get in their head. And... Because I was 6'5", I was in this middle area of power forward, not quite a center. And so uh, for the average man, it's like 6'5", you're tall. But that's not tall enough to be a center. So I had to use something else 
beyond my physical capabilities to wear them down. And so I would crack nasty jokes I would because I had to step them down. I would just try to frustrate my opponent. Um, listen, yeah. I, I don't think racism is ever uh, appropriate on, on, on the field. And, you know, I think it should be condemned. But right. I do think that when, much like battle, that your opponents is going to use anything they can to get in your head. And I think by leaving the field, you make them win. The easiest way to get me to shut down is defeat me. And I think we're giving way too much credit to the person that is using the mental gymnastics on their competitor. And But that's just a personal opinion. Um, and right. I, I guess I, I probably wouldn't have that perspective if I didn't use that same tactic uh, on the court. Uh, no, I appreciate it, exactly how you said it, too. It's a tough one, especially since they're kids, by the way. You know, they're 15, 16 yeah. years old, 17 years old. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know the right answer either. Um, but but I, I, I think you can't inoculate yourself from the ugliness of the world, even as we try to make everyone better individually. But you can make yourself tougher against the ugliness of the world. And um, Oh, and for sure, I, man. I, don't, it, I don't know. Yeah, you know, like, let me give you something. Every once in a while, <laughs> you'll have some crazy nut job that will disagree with something that I've said on air and say, hey, you're affirmative action hire. Okay, so anybody that mm -hmm. knows me, I, I, I've been in TV since I was 20 years old. Okay, that was 10, uh, 11 years ago. I mean, if, if I just made it to Fox and Friends now, uh, based on just affirmative action, I think that's pretty ridiculous. You know, I have a track record of record to, to go by. But besides proving my point, right, uh, and citing my work and all that, you can go that route. But what if I would decide that because someone has said that, that I want out? <laughs> I don't want to be on Fox and Friends. I think that's a ridiculous way to handle that absurd criticism of me or the accusation of right. me being affirmative. It's almost like they win either way by walking away from, I, I don't know, I'm just, a, I'm not in the, the business of walking away from a fight, no matter how ridiculous it is. Right, right, right. You didn't walk away from replacing Pete Hegseth to a dangerously successful level here on Off the Rails. And whether or not you do <laughs> replace Pete Hegseth on Off the Rails, or not. I want you more. I want you more here on the Will Kane show, man. And I want to have more conversations like the kind we have in the green room. So anytime, please yeah, come back, Lawrence Jones. Hell yeah. All See right, you, dude.